Radiant Church. <laughs> There's a guy named Tomas. He was a lifeguard down in Florida. One day someone ran up to him and said, there is someone drowning out in the water. And so as he does, he grabs his stuff, swims out in the water towards the person drowning and with the help of some other people is able to drag him to the shore where they administered CPR, called an ambulance and they saved his life. That's a pretty good day. As Tomas was taking his incident report and turning it in to his boss, instead of getting thanks, he got fired. His boss fired him because you see, the guy that he saved was swimming beyond the boundaries. He had gone past a sign that had clearly said, if you swim past here, you swim at your own risk. And for this company, that's not an area that they covered. So he had gone outside the boundaries to save this man. And yet Tomas is sitting there going, but wait a minute, everything I was trained, everything I was told was when you see somebody drowning, you save them. In anger, some of his coworkers also stood up to the company and said, what you're doing is wrong. We don't believe in this. And each of them got fired as well. Did you know that sometimes when you do the right thing, it's not going to be the popular thing? Do you know sometimes when you stand up for what you believe in and why you believe it, other people will not appreciate that. In fact, they may push back at you. You may be even mocked or ridiculed or persecuted. What happens as Christians even when we stand for what we believe in, what scholars and experts and people have been studying for thousands of years? What happens when we stand on the shoulders of these great people and stand for what we believe in and the world hates us? What happens then? Welcome to week four as we're walking through Romans chapter eight, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. I'm having a great time learning more. I hope you are as well too. It's been a, a really great series. And, and this week, man, ready to go. We're gonna talk about life in the spirit, kind of dive into that a little more and, and, and talk about the Holy Sport, sport <laughs> Holy Spirit and how he indwells our lives. I had this thing planned out, and as happens every now and then about midweek, God said, guess what? <laughs> you're not teaching that this week, Jason. Oh, you're going to teach Romans 8, but you're going to look at it differently. You're going to see what it is I have in this passage. And so guess what? I get to throw a curveball this week, because midweek, after I had already written a really good sermon, you don't get to hear, ha ha. <laughs> Instead, you get to hear what God had to say. <laughs> So with your grace, let's look at this passage that we're moving into in Romans the way God wants us to see it and dive in. The verse that I started with and began wrestling with and realized that God was speaking to me was Romans 8.18. 8, and in that verse, Paul starts this dialogue. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory to be revealed in us. And I stopped, and that, and that struck me as odd. Now, this is a verse I've read many times before. But sometimes you read a verse, and suddenly the aha light bulb goes off, and you're like, oh, there's something different to see here. And when I read this, what I read is I'm like, this is an odd change when he says, I consider our present sufferings. Because the first thing I'm asking now is, well, who's suffering, and why are they suffering? Up to this point, it's been a pretty exciting book. I mean, we open Romans 8, 1 with, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's good news. We move from that when we talked about and said, those who are in Christ Jesus are becoming more and more like Jesus. They are being transformed into the image of God. The word we use there was sanctification. I'm like, that's great news. That's awesome. And last week we talked about that those who make a decision for Jesus they become part of his family. They are adopted into the family of God where they become sons and daughters of the living God, heirs and co-heirs in Christ of the inheritance that he has for us. That's awesome news. And then suddenly I realized, but now he's talking about suffering. Like we turned a corner here suddenly from really good news to suffering. And again, just wrestling with that. Well, who's suffering? Why are they suffering? Suffering. 
And that's what I want to look in today because I was like, well, what's suffering here? And it's easy to go to the, to the normal ones. We're like, well, this was the Roman Empire. And about this time, probably persecution was beginning to rise in Rome. We're heading into the time period soon where Nero would come to rise and he would persecute the Christians heavily. In fact, even scattering them throughout the Roman Empire. And in fact, Paul and Peter both would lose their lives under the emperor Nero. So it's easy to maybe land there, but I don't think that's what's going on here. That's part of it. But then as I was thinking more about it, I remembered a book I was reading last week as I was really diving into this idea of what it means to be an adopted son and daughter of God and just really trying to understand that more. And I remember there was one paragraph in that book that really stood out to me as interesting. And now I understood why as I went back to it and read it again. It was a a book written by a guy named Aaron Hartman, and uh, it was called Adopted God's Plan A. But here's that that paragraph kind of I read that stood out. It said each family, that's each family in Roman culture, each family had its own cult worship that had been passed down from past generations. And when a child was adopted, he became part of this cult worship. For this reason, the language of family and brotherhood in the early Christian communities, coupled with this new Christian cult worship, notice what it says on the last line there, was seen by Roman authorities as an attack. And I went, aha, I think we're starting to understand a little bit more what's going on here. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, well, first off, the Roman Empire typically was pretty tolerant of other religions. As they went and captured other lands, they often integrated those religions into the Roman culture as a way to try to make that as peaceful and easy as as possible. As long as they obeyed Roman laws and as long as they paid their taxes, they let them kind of go and do their pagan religion as as they wished. And so this didn't have anything necessarily to do with that. But the one thing you did not mess with in Roman culture and among the Roman elite is you did not mess with family. You did not touch family. Want to get a sense of it? Turn on the Godfather, right? You don't mess with family. You know what I mean? You didn't mess with family. And so Paul's building on the concepts we've talked about here. That's why the aha button went on. See, we talked about being adopted last week. And that those who are saved are adopted children of God, which meant this new Christian community more and more was aware that as the adopted children of God, their heavenly family was more important than their earthly family. And more and more they were beginning to make decisions that were based upon what would God have me to do? What would my heaven family have me to do? Even sometimes in opposition to their earthly family. And because you don't mess with family, this was becoming a problem. More and more in the Roman Empire, as Christians had to differentiate themselves and say, we need to be heavenly minded. We talked about doing life in the spirit or life in the flesh. Life in the spirit means asking God, what is it you would have me to do? How would you have me to live? It's being heavenly minded. And then as we understand that we are adopted into God's family, even more we understand that adoption into God's family is more important than our earthly family. To which I ask you, have you ever seen it that way before? Do you understand That when you become part of his kingdom, when you become part of his family, that is now your primary identity. It's who you are and what you do. It is your devotion to Christ and being a part of his family as a citizen, representative, and an ambassador in his kingdom. As they did that, it was causing tension in families behind the scenes. Even in ideas with the Roman Empire where they were saying, Caesar is Lord bowed down to Caesar. And more and more, as people were converting and becoming Christians, they were saying, no, 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 Caesar is not Lord. Caesar is not King. Jesus Christ is my Lord. He is my King. And the more that began to come up, the more problems began to arise as as now they were in opposition to their family. And this wasn't just with uh, Roman families. This was with Jewish families too. Because as Jewish converts more and more were on the rise, they were saying, listen, I am free from the law. I am free 
free from the temple and its rules and its regulations. I am called to live a new way. And so, man, these new adopted children of God were now in opposition not only to their Roman counterparts, but to their Jewish counterparts as well, too. And so when you ask who's suffering, that's who's suffering. These new Christians now were having to step out in boldness and even defy their families to say God is more important. His way, his family, his kingdom supersedes all these traditions, all of these other religions, all of these other things. I am an adopted child of God living for him. That is not what the world wanted to hear. That is not what the families wanted to hear. And so when we ask, who is Paul trying to encourage? Because he's saying, he's trying to encourage them. In these present sufferings, they're not worth comparing to the glory. He's reminding them, listen, that inheritance I talked about, that future glory, all of that, keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye on what's coming and where we're going because you will face suffering here. Even Jesus said, on this earth, you will find trouble. He told them, listen, if they hated me, they're gonna hate you. There is a promise of suffering built into this life with Jesus Christ. This is the suffering Paul is talking about. This is what the Christians were facing. And so I ask you even more and more, what happens when you have to make a decision with your family what happens when you're faced with making a decision with your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, the world around you to stand up for what you believe, for who God is calling to be and what the Bible tells us about living this life with God? What happens when you have to stand up to them and say, I can't do that. I can't live that way. That is not who we are. That is not what God created me to be. I can't do that. What happens then? And I'll tell you what happens for a lot of Christians I've been noticing lately. The problem and what I see more and more is they compromise. We're just seeing more and more compromise. And I get why. Because at first, compromise looks nice. Listen, we'll compromise just a little bit and, and, and I'll try to meet you halfway on this thing. And it seems loving. It seems wise, even. It seems like you're doing them a favor. But what we find out is a little compromise here and a little compromise there and a little compromise here becomes a bunch of big compromises later. And we have to be careful. It's a bit like a death by paper cuts. You have to be careful. And what seems like loving can be one of the most evil things you can do to somebody. Today, I want to take a step out of Romans 8, and then we will come back and tie it in. But I want us to look at a king in Israel, ancient Israel, that I believe made some compromises and probably at the time seemed like good compromises, but that these compromises would not only affect the next generation after him, but would continue to affect future generations even for hundreds of years. To see that little compromises on top of little compromises on top of little compromises become bigger compromises later. You say, who's that king? Who are we talking about today? And that's King Solomon. I want to look at King Solomon today. And what's interesting is when we talk about King Solomon, if you're familiar with King Solomon, um, and I remember even growing up as a kid, we often speak of King Solomon kind of with rose-colored glasses on. He was a great king. He was wiser than anybody, wealthier than anybody. But I stop right there and immediately tell you that wealth and power and influence, those are earthly comparisons, not necessarily heavenly. We often use earthly things to compare people to, because at the time when Solomon was king, Israel was at, its, at the height of its power and influence in the world. By an earthly standpoint, he had made it. He was doing great things, and we often praise him as such based on earthly criteria. He was rich, he was powerful. He had a lot of influence. Good guy. 
But I wonder today if we can't take a look at the Bible and see what God had to say about his life, particularly at the end of his life. What did the Bible have to say about King Solomon? And we get that in 1 Kings chapter 11. We see in that, it says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women. How'd you like that to be the opening of your obituary? You know what I mean? King Solomon liked the ladies. He loved many foreign women. And they were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after other gods. Here's a big word, nevertheless. Solomon held fast to them in love. He had, that's not a typo, 700 wives. Good grief. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And his wives, it says, led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And what does it say after that? And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God. My dear friends, look at me. Is your heart fully devoted to the Lord your God? It was not fully devoted to the Lord his God. And so Solomon did what? Evil. Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely. That's a different Solomon than I was raised on. Heaven forbid at the end of my life, on my obituary from God, it says at the end, you did evil in the eyes of the Lord. You were led astray. You were not fully devoted. May that be none of our obituaries at the end. And yet, that is what we see with Solomon. What we learn is he made small concessions and he made small compromises here and he made small compromises there and they ended up being big compromises later. And you say, well, what compromises did he make? Well, right away, I'll tell you, Moses had left some instructions on what kings were to be like before he died. And so we're not going to read the whole thing, but in Deuteronomy 17, he left us with what I call four must not rules. If Israel were to have a king, The first one is this, no foreign kings. The second is, you must not acquire a great number of horses. Number three, you must not take many wives. And number four, you must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Well, let's break this down a little bit because what we're going to find out is Solomon compromised on at least three of the four. You see, the first one, no foreign kings. He had that one, no problem. He was... Son of David, born in Israel, an Israelite, he's not a foreign king. He, he had that one okay. That's where it stopped, unfortunately. Next one, notice it says, acquired a great number of horses. Now, this can be hard to understand in our modern context because we don't, we don't rely on horses like they did back then. We have cars and other kind of vehicles. But it's important to know that the primary use of a horse was for war. They were for chariots. And chariots were the offensive weapon of the day. They were that time period's tanks. You used chariots to attack an enemy. They were not defensive. They were primarily offensive weapons. And so what God is telling Israel through them is to say, do not get a bunch of chariots because when you do that, it will change you as a country. You will now begin to start acting like an empire. What do empires do? They expand their borders. They expand their assets. They expand their resources, even at the cost of whoever is in their way because empires exist to consume. Empires exist to expand. And when you start having this mentality of having lots of horses, first off, you no longer trust God to protect you as a country. You are now trusting in your might, your power, your things, your wealth. And so you've transferred your your, your trust away from God. But on top of that, you're now beginning to act like an empire. And God said, I did not create Israel to act like an empire. I created Israel to be a light on the hill to the Gentiles and to the neighboring countries to let them know that Yahweh God is the king of the universe. 
That's the danger there. He's saying, do not, as a country, become an empire. Do not consume. Do not oppress. Do not enslave. In fact, what's interesting, another big mistake when he decided, oh, he, he did start getting a bunch of horses and he built cities just to house them, in fact. And what's interesting, and it's easy to skip over when we talk about the story of the temple being built because Solomon was the one who built the temple. It says he used slave labor to do it from foreign countries. When Israel had been instructed very much from God, you do not enslave other people. Do not forget that you were slaves yourself once. One more concession. One more thing. Small, small, but they end up becoming big things over time. Number three, do not take many wives. And you may be asking, well, at what point on his way to 700 did he cross that line? And I will tell you very clearly in Genesis, when God is telling us about creation, he said that a, a man leaves his mother and his father and is joined with his, with his wife, and the two become one. Jesus in Matthew 19 would repeat the Genesis story just to put a punctuation mark on it. And he would say it verbatim, a man leaves his mother and his father. He is joined with his wife and the two become one. I realize this is not popular with our culture today, but what the Bible says is that marriage is between a man and a woman where the two become one. And so you ask, where did Solomon leave that? Well, at number two and beyond. That's when he moved out of that. And that wasn't even the bad part. On top of that, he had 300 concubines. So let me ask the ladies out there who are thinking someday I'd like to get married and some of the others who are all already married. How many of you would like to share your husband with 300 concubines? One more concession, one more compromise. Now we have Solomon starting to compromise on views of relationships and views of sexuality. And those wives would bring with them their own gods and their own ways of doing things because he then compromised on another rule, which was you do not marry foreign wives. As that verse said, they will lead you astray. Another compromise, small compromises. And frankly, it probably looked like a good compromise because you can justify, listen, if I marry this uh, girl from that kingdom, and if I marry this girl from that kingdom, if I marry that girl from that kingdom, well, then we will have peace treaties and, and those countries will not attack us at that point. And so this is just good politics. That's why I'm doing that. So I'm making this concession. I'm moving this compromise so that we're at peace with our neighbors around us. Because remember, Solomon had moved from trusting God into trusting his own ways. One more. Compromise. One more. Concession. And do not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. What do we know of Solomon? Well, 1 Kings 10.23 says, King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. And again, we'd be clear, the Bible doesn't say being wealthy is a problem. What it does say, and it's very clear with, is that the love of money is the root of all evil. And Moses knew, and God knew, speaking through him centuries ahead of time, that the tendency is when we collect large amounts of gold and large amounts of silver, this can move us more into a protectionism posture. I have to protect what I have from the people around me who want to take it from me, steal it from me. And, and when we do that, now we're living in fear and now we have anxiety and that moves into greed. And he's saying, listen, again, you are a light on the hill. Use the resources I give you to be a blessing to the nations around you. Don't hoard. Don't keep for yourself. Use that to bless others. How about you and your life? What we find out is Solomon's concessions, his compromises, little compromises here, little compromises here, little compromises there, little compromises there, ended up being big compromises later. Not only at the end of his life 
was he not focused on God anymore and been led astray. But when a very short period of time after he died, the, the Israel country split into two. It could not stand. It became two different countries. And both of those countries then would take the compromises of Solomon and would take them to the next level. What we see is the king of Israel shortly after in 1 Kings 14. It says this, they also set up for themselves high places, that is places of worship other than the temple, sacred stones and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. There were even male shrine prostitutes in the land and the people engaged in all the detestable practices. And you say, what happened here? What's going on in this? What happened is this, as Solomon married all of these women from all these various countries, they brought their own religions. And because he compromised and said, listen, let's keep peace in the home. It's shalom in the home is most important. Let's allow them to have and set up their own little temples and places of worship throughout Israel just so that they have the freedom to worship the way they do. But in the end, Yahweh's still God. But what we see within one generation after he dies is they take that even a step further. Now we see that they're putting up Asherah poles and we say, who is Asherah? Asherah was a fertility goddess. During that time, Asherah poles typically were nude images that went up. And Asherah temples, when they set them up, had temple prostitutes. And you paid money, and that's how the temple made money and stayed open. So what we see now is where Solomon compromised on some values of sexuality and relationships. They're now taking it to the next level. Now we've got prostitutes in the land. And by the way, the male shrine prostitutes, they weren't for the ladies. Now we're taking it a step forward and we're redefining what we believe on sexuality and relationships and pornography and all sorts of other things. That's what's going on in the next generation. The generation after that, the next set of kings would invite a god named Baal, Baal who is the sun god. And this would further redefine the relationship with Israel and God because now what Israel was saying is we believe there are many gods. There are many ways to God. And, and that looks nice. We all just want to get along. And one of the problems we see is when worshiping Baal, as these kings began to then sacrifice their children to the fire, it says. And now what we have with this introduction of Baal into Israel is a redefining of human worth and now also a redefining of the value of children. Now they are beginning to loosen up and compromise on what we believe about human life and the value of human life and even children because they were throwing their children in the fire to try to make Baal happy. Compromises on top of compromises on top of compromises. And within two generations later, we have a king named Ahab and Jezebel. And what we find then is they made Baal worship the official religion of the land, and now they were killing the worshipers of God. Within four to five generations of compromises on top of compromises on top of compromises, Israel went from Yahweh is the one true God to Baal is our God and we're killing anybody who worships Yahweh. Compromises, concessions. It's about that time we heard from a prophet named Elijah who would cry out to the Lord, we pick that up in 1 Kings chapter 19. He says, I have been zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. You ever felt that way when you stood your ground on something, when you said, this is right, and I'm going to hold to what is right? I am not going to waver. I'm going to keep to the truth. But everyone around you, the world, the culture, your family, your workforce, everyone's saying, no, we disagree with you. You ever been there? And it feels like you versus the world. It's interesting what God had to say back to him. 
He said, I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all of whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. God says, I have reserved a remnant, a group of people who in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the culture saying, here's what we think is right, in the midst of the government saying, here's how you're supposed to live, in the midst of the understanding from everyone about what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it, I have reserved a remnant of people who refuse to bow down to the culture, refuse to bow down to the government, refuse to bow down to anything that wavers from the word of God. And I ask you, are you one of those 7,000? Because we live in times where compromising is happening and somebody's going to have to stand the ground and say, not this generation because not the next one either. The decisions we make today have ramifications on future generations. What looks loving, what looks kind, what looks like a good compromise is one concession on top of another and they become large compromises later. Within 200 years, it's so interesting, we read this of the Israel kings. It said he, Manasseh was his name, he erected altars to the Baals and made Asherah poles. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshiped them. Notice what it says here. He built altars in the temple of the Lord. He built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his children in the fire, practiced divination and witchcraft, sought omens and consulted mediums and spiritists, and then he took the image what he had made. How many of us sometimes like to make an image of God that is our liking? Like, I think God looks like this. God on the sixth day created man in his own image. And I often joke, and on the eighth, we created him in ours. He took the image he had made, and what did he do? He put it in God's temple. They had kicked God completely out at that point. It wasn't even the temple of God anymore. Small compromises on top of small compromises on top of small compromises, which gets us to our so what moment. What does all this mean, Jason? We get back to that Romans 8 verse. We see Paul reminding that our current sufferings do not compare to our present, to our future. He's reminding a group of Christians who are standing up for what they believe in, even when it opposed their family, even when it opposed their neighbors and the culture around them. He's saying, our present sufferings do not compare to our future inheritance. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on where God is taking us, realizing that in the end, all things in heaven and all things on earth will be brought under one Godhead that is Jesus Christ. That's Ephesians chapter one. God said it, God will do it. Keep your eyes on what God is doing. Keep your eyes on the prize that you have an inheritance and that inheritance for those who are steadfast, for those who hold true to the word of God. There is the promise of heaven and eternal life with Jesus Christ for all eternity. And you just have to ask yourself, what's more important, obeying the culture or obeying God? That's the flesh or the spirit we talked about earlier in this chapter. Who do you serve, the culture or God? But I promise you this, if you answer God, and I would answer it carefully, you will face torture, suffering, persecution, pain. Wish I had better news for you. But just as Elijah talking to God was told, I've reserved 7,000 who will not bend their knee. I ask you, What's your posture going to be? Who do you serve? Who do you bow down to? I'm not asking you to be unloving. Christians always are loving. Everything we do, we are called to unconditional love. We always love people 
There is no ifs, ands, or buts to it. No matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, you are loved. That's at the core of everything we believe. But just because I love everybody does not mean I affirm all things. And there's a huge difference. We are called to be loving, but we are not always affirming. You say, you don't understand, Jason. I've got a family member that's dealing with this thing. You don't understand. That's my child. That's my son. That's my daughter. That's my coworker. That's my... You don't understand, Jason. And I say, I understand more than you know. I'm walking it too, Okay. Where as a family, we had to stand firm and say, we love you, but we cannot affirm this. We are called to be a light in the darkness. You will be called names. You will be told you are unloving. People will not always understand. But you have to ask, who do I serve? Who do I bow my knee to? Is it the world and its ways? Or is it God and the obedience he is calling us to? Because my dear friends, this isn't really about you. This is about the next generations. And the compromises we make will become bigger compromises in the next generation and bigger compromises after that. And before long, God is no longer present. Stand firm. Stand on the truth. And do not bow your knee to the culture. Let's pray.